Hi, I'm Liberty Blake. I'm a collage artist and I'm going to be showing you some collage techniques of projects that you can do at home. Um, collage, um, in case you haven't um, come across it, is uh, a very straightforward art form. You basically need paper and scissors and glue. Um, you're basically cutting out paper and sticking it down. It's, it's that simple. But it has such potential um, and room for exploration. Um, the thing I love most about it is the accessibility. It's really something that you can do in your own home with um, materials that probably you have around the house. Um, you can gather and collect materials very easily and cheaply. Um, so it's, um, it's a financially viable ver um, art form. And, um, and it's, it's as quick or as long as you, you know, it's as, as depending on the time you have to invest in it. So you can pick it up and do a 10 minute collage or you can spend several hours. So it's a really, really good art form to jump into, especially if you, you haven't done art for a while. So um, I'm gonna give you a brief um, introduction of, um, of the materials that we're gonna use. Um, you'll have a kit that will have arrived um, for you to do the, the projects, um, and then you can also collect your own things as well. Um, I always have a large selection of colored paper um, to work with. Um, just plain color paper. You can use craft paper or anything like that. And then I, and then I have large collections of of visual material that involve pictures. And that's what we're gonna use for narrative collage. Um, it's, a, it's often called photo montage, but I call it narrative collage because in my mind, it's, it's a collage that kind of tells a story because you have images that relate to each other in a, in a narrative way. So, um, so briefly, the things that we're going to work on um, in this, in this kind of online workshop um, are abstract collage. And I'll show you a couple of my pieces just to give you an idea. Um, the way I would describe abstract collage is basically it's a collage that doesn't have anything going on that's recognizable. So you don't have people cut out or animals or anything like that. It's all about color and shape. It's really a fun way to kind of get into playing with the material. Um, I'll show you these more in the actual class. Then we have what I call narrative collage, and that is um, collage that involves imagery. So you're cutting it out from magazines or old books, and you're juxtaposing different images together to create some kind of story. And again, I'll show you these in the class at more length. Um, so um, that's a really quick, brief overview of what we'll be doing. Um, you will get, you'll have a lot of fun. It's really easy. Um, so um, it's just such a good, a good art form to jump into and, and do to de-stress and play with materials and just enjoy doing something for yourself. So um, really, really fun. I hope you do the course and um, see you soon. Hi, uh, my name is Liberty Blake and I'm a collage artist. Um, I live here in Utah, um, but I'm not from here originally. I am um, originally from England and I came out to Utah in 1997 when I was 27 and um, really came out for an adventure here and didn't intend to stay. But um, I just fell in love with the, the outside here, the wilderness and the, the kind of the space of Utah. And um, I'm still here, still loving, still loving um, the wilderness here. And it's very much inspiration for my work. So, um, so I'll talk a little bit about um, my collage work that I do now and how it relates to being here in Utah. Um, I 
um, spend a lot of time in the mountains. Uh, I'm an avid mountain biker. And um, so I find inspiration from, from the desert, from the, from the wild places here. And um, I take that inspiration and I don't, I don't photograph it and reproduce it, but I kind of, um, I feel like I process, process that um, visual landscape. And then um, the memory of it, when I get back into my studio, the memory of the landscape um, becomes abstracted. And when I say abstracted, I mean um, kind of broken down into non-literal imagery. So maybe color and shape. Um, it converts to. And so the memory, you know, memory is kind of fuzzy and um, not always precise. So that process um, allows me to convert what I saw and what I felt in the landscape into a visual representation of, of the place. So it's very much of kind of the West and of here. So, um, uh, my work, you can, you can look my work up online. I have a website, uh, Liberty Blake Collage, um, and you can see a, a broader range of, of my work. But I, I have a few here, but, um, which gives you an idea of, of abs the abstraction that, um, that uh, my work really is. So it's, it's, it's color and shape, and not, really obviously landscape always you know on first glance you would you would see pattern really in color um, but to me when i look at each piece it's very much a story um, even though it's not uh, a story in a traditional sense uh, it's the memory of the place it's the emotional response i had to the place um, and it's very personal and, and that's really um, the important thing about art for me is that it's a self-expression of something that you have inside. It's personal to you. It's not about duplicating something you've seen. It's about finding something inside that you want to express in a visual way. And so, um, so I think that's very, that's very important. The other great thing about art is that, and collage very much, there's really no right way to do it or, or wrong way to do it. It's, um, it's, a, it's an art form that you can experiment with, you can play with it, you can, um, you can, you can try things out and, and um, they may work, they may not, but it, it really, there's no one way to do it and it's very accessible. So I'm really excited to, to do this course um, with you and tell you more about kind of how collage um, is a part of my life. Um, I started doing collage probably uh, over 30 years ago. Um, my kids were small or my, f my first son was little. Um, I come from um, a background of painting. So I had studied um, painting and illustration at art school in England and um, in uh, a town called Bath. I was born in London and then um, was living in Bath. And um, so I studied painting and, um, but it's somewhat toxic. <laughs> so when my son was little, I really couldn't have paint set up and I couldn't, I didn't have much time to work. And so I needed something that I could pick up and put down quickly because I had very small amounts of time that I could, could do my art in. And painting just wasn't a good um, art form to be really doing that with. So I started doing collage really for that reason that I, had, I might have 10 minutes to do something creative. And I wanted to be able to um, have a box, put it on the kitchen table, make something and then put it away. So it was really... Um, really easy to, to uh, access. Um, so I started to do it 
doing it for that reason, but I, um, I just fell in love with the materials. I love the textural element of paper. I love the, the warmth of paper. And, um, and as I, I mean, I've worked with it for a long time, but the, the, the um, style that I've kind of ended up with has taken 30 years to, to kind of um, to get to, and it'll keep changing, of course. Um, so we'll be working with what I call narrative collage, which is kind of like a story. You know, it has elements of, of recognizable objects. Um, that's probably the type of collage that um, most people are familiar with because, um, you know, you have a pile of magazines and you cut things out and you glue them down. That's um, much more uh, common type of, of work and, and um, most people are, associate the word collage with that. So we'll be doing some of that. We'll be doing some abstract collage and we'll also be doing a, touching on design as well um, as a segue into the abstract collage. Um, I've, taught, um, I've taught a lot. Um, I've taught kids, I've taught adults, I've taught great big groups, um, worked with you know, individuals. Um, and it's always eye-opening to me when I, when I share collage with other people. Um, it's, it's such a great thing to, to kind of jump into and, and try. And so many people um, are hesitant if they haven't got a background of art. You know, they'll say, oh, I got, I, I'm not an artist. Um, I, I can only draw stick figures. It's very, like, emotionally, they feel emotionally vulnerable about trying something. It would be like if I was asked to sing an opera on a stage, it would be devastating and really intimidating <laughs> because I have no background in singing. So, um, so I understand how um, it's hard sometimes to jump in and do something you, you're not familiar with. But collage is the best art form to do that with. You know, it's just, it's just you can't go wrong. So I'm really excited to, to be able to share it um, in this way with, with you. Um, I have worked on different kinds of projects. I've done collaborative projects with, with groups of people. One of them is um, a project called Work in Progress, which you might have seen um, in, in and around Utah. It's um, a, we run workshops where people do a stencil portrait of a, of a female, um, you know, any woman throughout history that has kind of contributed in some way to society. And um, then they are collaged onto these very large panels. They're four by eight feet. And currently there are 14 panels. So it's, I think, 60 foot long or something. It's a huge project and it's um, definitely the biggest collage I've ever done. Um, the whole piece is I, the, the stencil portraits we, that the community members make, I then take and cut out and, and stencil them into a, a crowd on these, on these large panels. Um, you can look it up online if you're interested in, in uh, seeing more about it. So um, yeah, I'm excited to share, to share collage with you and I hope you do the course. Thank you. I'm going to introduce you to um, the materials that we're going to use um, in the workshop and also um, some other types of materials that you might uh, gather for yourself if you continue to, to enjoy collage. So um, I'll start with the base. Um, you'll have an art kit um, that comes with the course. So you'll have some things to work with to get into the, um, to, you know, try collage out. Um, but I'm going to show you um, ways to, to expand the process that's cheap and accessible and, you know, really easy to, to go and get yourself. So I love working with collage on um, panel, on wood board, um, because it doesn't buckle. So it stays flat. You can use any of the glues that um, I'm going to recommend here today, and um, and it won't curl like paper does. So this is just um, uh, 
forgotten what kind of wood it is, chipboard or something. Really, you can use anything. This came from um, a scrapyard and I just cut it into uh, pieces. It's partially painted. Really, anything works. You can buy panels as well from art supply stores or craft stores um, and they're good to use as well. But um, that's a, a range of things that are pretty cheap and accessible and great to work on and obviously any scale. Um, you can also um, buy drywall. Um, the, it comes in kind of two foot by two foot squares and um, quite cheap from, from hardware stores. And it's a paper surface with plaster on the inside and it's a really good surface to work on. So if you get excited about working on a bigger scale, that's a good cheap way of, of experimenting. Um, and I can list all these things um, in the written materials um, that will come with the kit so that you know, kind of, you can remember all the stuff. Um, the other thing you can do is use the covers of old books. So um, I buy old books to cut up for visual material, but then I often will use the, the um, hard um, back covers as a base to collage on and you all often have a lot of you know interesting elements and colors that um, might give you inspiration for how your collage um, will will go so that's another background material that you can use the next thing i'll talk about is the paper um, i always have a collection of plain color paper um, this is just thick um, thick paper, bright colors. You can use construction paper, really cheap. Um, you can buy more expensive papers from an art supply store. Um, we have all kinds of great shops in, in Utah. I don't know if you know Clever Octopus. They um, resell art materials at a really good um, price. So if you're in the Salt Lake area, highly recommend them. Um, I got all these papers from there. And then, um, and then I have a range of things that I've cut out from books and magazines. So um, just piles of it. I just collect all kinds of things. This is scrapbook paper. Um, that can be nice because it'll have patterns. So it's kind of nice to have things like that. And then pictures from magazines and old books, just things that kind of take my fancy. I think, oh, that, that could make a nice story. Um, and even, you know, the mailer, the, the awful things that we get through our, in our post box that we all throw immediately in the trash. You never know, you might want to make a collage out of a, a roasted turkey or something like that. Um, and then I all, I just have piles of things that I've cut out from magazines, uh, bananas, never know when you might need something like that. And I collect them and I just have uh, a whole bunch and they're like a wonderful inspiration. Here are um, a pile of books. I, I, people are, are very hesitant about cutting up books and I am too. But um, I try and find things that are about to be pulped. So when libraries have really got you know, rid of things and they're not going to pass them on or be able to sell them, I try and get books like that. They've been scribbled in or they're just too worn out or dated and people are not interested anymore. And I collect them because they're so um, inspiring. You have, especially encyclopedias, you have so many different things that you can um, find in books like that that um, might inspire um, a humorous collage of some sort. Old magazines, popular mechanics. Um, I love old, old books and magazines. I find them really inspiring. Old um, life magazine. Um, so those are the kind of things I buy them from old library sales, um, thrift stores, uh, collectible shops sometimes have things like that. Um, things that people are throwing away, I just squirrel them away and keep them on hand for, for projects in the future. Um, so that's the paper. Oh, wallpaper. 
is a, a good thing. It usually comes in large rolls and so it can cover a big expanse if you're doing a larger collage. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is uh, scissors. Um, you can buy a pair of scissors for one dollar and it works just fine. So um, that's a really, you know, everyone has scissors around the house. Um, I, because I'm working in this um, field professionally, have two favorite pairs of scissors. This one is an old um, pair of scissors that I got from a thrift store that I just love. It's larger so I can cut longer pieces of paper. And then I have these really little fine ones with a pointed tip. So if you really get into this and get excited about doing collage, if you're working um, cutting out very, very small things with lots of detail, I do recommend having a pair of scissors that has a pointed tip. Makes it very um, much easier, less frustrating. Um, the next thing we'll talk about is glue. So there's many different um, types of glue that you can use. When I'm working on paper, um, sticking paper to paper, and um, it's not, it might buckle if I use a liquid glue. So I, when I'm doing quick collages that are just really kind of almost like exercises um, to warm up, um, I'll use a craft stick or a glue stick. Uh, this you can you know put the glue on really easily and it doesn't buckle the paper so that's um, a good thing to have on hand and then liquid glues there's a variety of things you can buy Elmer's school glue very accessible Modge Podge which is um, very similar to matte medium which is kind of like a more of a fine art version of Mod Podge those are almost like a halfway between, um, almost like a, a varnish and a glue. You know, you can create a surface that um, looks very finished with those. And then tacky glue is very similar to Elmer's glue. It's just a bit thicker. So if you're working with thicker papers, sometimes that is easier to use. Um, then there is wheat paste and we're going to do a demo on how to make that um, because I like to use it for larger collages and um, I've done a lot of mural work and wheat paste is what um, street artists use to paste up um, paste ups <laughs> there uh, and it's really easy to make it's basically flour and water and sugar and you heat it and then you can make large quantities of glue which really gives you uh, the opportunity to um, work on large scale you can do murals on the wall or murals on large panels and it's cheap and easy to make so um, that's a rundown of all the materials that we'll use in the uh, in the workshop and um, and i hope that's helpful We are going to, um, I'm going to show you how to make wheat paste. So this is a, um, a glue um, that we'll use during the process of, of the collages that I'll demo to you. And um, it's a really easy glue to make. It's basically flour, sugar, and water. So, um, so we'll start, um, you need to have a pan and um, a hot plate or a cooker. And you're going to start with um, one cup of water, which you're going to boil. Just turn it up here. So I have one cup of water in here measured out already, and it's just about to boil. And then you're going to take three tablespoons. And this, um, this recipe will be uh, in your art kit pack, so you don't need to remember all the amounts but I just want to show you the process because the materials um, are very simple but the technique is quite precise I'm going to do three tablespoons of white flour it's better to use white than whole wheat because then you don't have little bits of, of flour um, pieces in your glue so that's three tablespoons of flour this is ten teaspoons, tablespoons 
of water and it's cold water. And I'm going to very slowly add this into the flour. Um, I use a whisk, you can use a fork or a spoon, but a whisk um, mixes it much better. The goal is to not have lumps. So slowly adding the water and stirring quite vigorously is the best way to do this. So I'm going to make sure all the loose flour is stirred in. Give it a good vigorous stir. So this is a, a type of glue that um, would have been used probably first, I mean, the Victorian, in the Victorian era, the um, scrapbooks that were very common back then and the large screens um, that were, were made would have used this wheat paste. Um, very, very early basic glue. It's great because if you accidentally eat some of it, you're not gonna have any adverse effects or if your kids eat it. So um, that's stirred. Now I've got, I've got the water boiling here. This is my one cup of water. This is boiling and I'm going to slowly add this mixture into, into the hot water. So really slowly. I often will turn, if my water is boiling really um, vigorously, I'll probably turn it down low to do this stage. You don't want um, to add it to really hot water too quickly because what happens is it um, tends to get clumpy and lumpy in there and then it's really hard to kind of undo that. It almost, it's like it cooks the flour and then you get the wrong consistency but I'm gonna slowly keep adding that mixture in. And then the important thing is to keep stirring. So I am going to want to have this um, boil for, gently boil, I would say, for a minute or two. Um, but I do not want um, it to be too hot because then it burns on the bottom. And if I walk away and stop stirring, the same thing can happen. It can go lumpy and burn on the bottom of the pan. So you really want to keep, keep, keep that stirring. So let's imagine that that's boiled for a couple of, of minutes. I'm going to take it off the, um, the heat or turn the heat down and I'm going to add sugar. Just white sugar, I would say avoid using any kinds of um, darker sugars because it might just tint the glue, um, make it not as clear as you want it to be. And I'm going to do two tablespoons. The great thing about this glue is it's very forgiving. If you, if you do a little bit too, much water or a little bit too much flour. You can correct it if the texture of the glue is not, um, is not thick enough or it's too thin. Um, you can add or take away ingredients very simply. And really that's it. I'm going to um, put this into a container. I'll let it cool for a while first because I don't want to use it when it's really, really hot. Um, but any kind of jar, um, glass jar or canister, uh, when it's cooled down, you pour it in um, and then you can use it for, um, for a period of time. If you, um, when you've finished uh, using it at the end of the day, you want to p keep it in the fridge. Otherwise, it um, it really, like any kind of food, spoils quite quite um, badly. So um, once you put it in the fridge, you can use it for a few days, probably up to about um, a week. Um, I will give um, I will put the recipe in the art kit printed out. But um, bear in mind that um, you can multiply the ingredients. 
and make large batches of this really easily. And that way you can do large projects or murals um, and uh, it's cheap and easy to use. Thank you. So in this um, section, we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about design, basic design principles and um, how that translates into um, making abstract collages or any kind of abstract artwork actually. So I've made a bunch of um, samples. One important thing to remember with art is that there are um, really no rules. There's, you know, there's no right, there's no wrong, there's no um, absolute way to do anything. And so when I introduce things like this, which are, which are you know, I could call design rules, um, they're not really rules. They're guidelines and um, a way of organizing, um, organizing visuals so that you start thinking about what you like looking at and what you don't like looking at. Um, because a lot of making art, art making, is to do with um, choices that you make and then the, the choices that you make uh, to edit or the things that you choose not to do are as important as the things you choose to do. So it's good to be alert and to start thinking about visuals and um, what appeals to you personally. Um, so when I show you these guidelines, this is, um, this is uh, we'll call them design rules, and then I'll also say, make sure that you also break all the rules. You don't want to follow things um, uh, absolutely ever with art. So um, I'm gonna go through and just kind of talk briefly about um, some design principles. So um, this is, I've done them all in black and white, so they're a high contrast and just really simple. Um, and then I'll show you some color ones at the end. Um, this is a piece that's divided into thirds. So it doesn't really matter what way we look at it. Um, I want you to look at all of these and think about how they make you feel. Um, I know how I feel when I look at paper uh, images that are divided into thirds. Now these are really obvious. These are, this is black and white paper. You can see the thirds really easily. But you might find that if you look at a work of art, um, let's say the Mona Lisa, um, because most people are familiar with that. Um, the figure is in the center of the, of the picture. And then either side of her is space. So that is, um, divided into thirds. You have the two sides and then you have the middle where she is. And that is a very comforting um, design. Uh, you, you, feel, it's, uh, you feel enclosed, I guess, by it. It feels comfortable. Um, as opposed to this. This has a different feel. Um, divided in half. There's something about it for me that is uh, less comfortable than this. Now again, rules are me meant to be broken, so I'm not saying do one thing and not the other, but it's something to consider when you look at these two things in, in comparison. How do they make you feel? Because that's really the the crux of art. How does it make you feel? We all feel differently about different pieces. I will look at one piece of art and uh, love it passionately, and someone else will look at it and hate it. So it's not, um, it's, there's no absolute right and wrong or good or bad ever in art. Here's another one divided um, halves, quarters. Um, we'll talk about continuous lines um, with these. So your eye follows lines. We could, let's say, this one. Your eyes tend to go um, follow along pathways. 
So these would be directional and your eye usually will, will find a path across a picture plane. So when you have something like this, your eye tends to follow along. Now it's not necessarily linear. You don't necessarily start here and go along to the end, but you'll, you'll find yourself kind of focusing on this. Um, this particular piece, because it goes all the way across the picture plane, your eye is led off the side of the picture plane. Um, that can be advantageous. You may want that to happen, but you may want to think about how you keep the viewer engaged with your work of art. Now, this would be a way of stopping your eye from going across and disappearing off the edge of the picture plane, maybe onto someone else's piece of artwork that's off to the side. You want them to look at your piece of artwork. How do you keep them engaged with what you've made? So there's, there's visual tricks that you can use to, to keep um, someone looking at your work, keep them engaged in this space. Um, the eye follows along and then it's stopped. It's a simple trick really, um, but something to think about when you're designing. So continuous lines, it's another interesting thing to include in a work of art. Nothing is going to be quite this literal, but these are really good. It's really good to play with collage and think about creating um, abstract images that are engaging in some way. So this is something you can do using a craft stick and paper. Um, really easy way to get warmed up when you're about to make a collage. This is um, an example of continuous line. This line here comes all the way along, then there's a gap, but then it carries on. That's compelling and interesting when you're looking at a piece of work. It creates a visual dynamic uh, design that, that your eye is interested in. It's curious. You're like, hmm, what's happening here? Oh, here's this line, and then it hops across and carries on here. Really simple. It's just two corners of paper stuck down onto another piece of paper, high contrast, black and white, but instantly you have a design of some, some sort that it has, you know, elements of, of interest. This is another one, continuous line, but broken by another um, shape. So another element, this is three elements now. You've got the black and the white and the gray breaking up this continuous line. Um, here's another thing which is um, connected to continuous line and something to think about. Your eye follows an arrow always. So a triangle, any kind of wedge shape, a traditional arrow, that's why when you're looking at signage and you're looking for the bathroom, you'll see an arrow pointing in the direction. Your eye follows the point and you go off to the bathroom. Um, this um, is very useful in, in art, but also something to think about because your eye can be taken off the surface again. So how do you keep someone looking at your piece of art? How do you keep their eye on the page? You can block, create a visual block. Your eye trans follows down, down this point, and instead of being carried off, it's actually stopped visually. Here's another example of that. This triangle here stops your eye as it transfers, as it follows down this, this point here. Also think about um, the negative space or what's left over. So I've stuck the white paper down, but, but these elements here, the negative space, the space that's created um, by the pieces that I've put down also, also needs to be compelling. So always, always look at those elements as you're creating your composition. Your eye comes down here, it follows down to this point, this triangle here goes to the same point and you have a focal point. When you look at this piece, if it was, you know, if it was on the wall, you probably find your eyes hovering around here, which is almost the center of the piece of paper, which is great because that's what you want people to look at, the, your, your artwork. Um, here we have circles, the kind of the power of different shapes. 
A circle is a very compelling shape. Your eye gravitates to it. It's completely contained. We're very familiar with circles. You have to think about, um, you know, how from the moment we're born, we've looked at faces, our eyes, our mouth, our, our face shape is a, is a circle. We're compelled to look towards, um, towards the shape. So it's a very, it's a, you know, an interesting, powerful thing to include in a design um, when you're constructing any kind of abstract collage or a collage with design elements included. This is all, this is the power of red. Red is a very powerful color. And when you include it, especially when you include it in a, a, um, a collage that may be more muted colors, your eye immediately is drawn to this. It's a small shape, a small size, but very powerful. So think about using color wisely and, um, and use it to draw people in, um, but consider the, consider the power of different colors and, and how you can utilize that. Uh, the X shape is a, is a strong, um, attractor to your eye is drawn towards that. Um, this is another example of negative space. Um, the things I cut out, this is the off cut from that. I always keep, when I'm making collage, I always keep the off cuts um, because I like the chance element of um, paper that I haven't intentionally chosen to cut a shape, but but what's left is very interesting. So I use that quite often in my work. Um, so I just stuck it down to, to give that example. Um, then I, I made some color versions just um, to give an idea of how design combines with the power of color. Um, if, you, if you work with opposite colors, so on the color wheel, you have uh, the primary colors and secondary colors, and each color has an opposite. So um, orange and blue are opposite colors, and um, therefore when you put them together, they're very powerful. They pop. They look very, very strong and, and dynamic. Uh, red and green are also opposite colors. See how they almost, sometimes if you get just the right tone, they almost flash and shimmer. So it may be too much. You may want to avoid that. It may be too um, intense, but just to be aware of it, purple and yellow, they're opposites. Um, be aware of these things so that you can utilize them or avoid them. Um, the, other, the other element to, that I want to touch on here is that the feeling that you get from things is different from some, the feeling someone else gets. It's very important as you work in these art forms to kind of touch base with how you feel about what you're doing. And um, rather than being externally motivated by looking at other things, focus inside and think about what you like, what you respond to. Um, even if you don't have an art background, even if you would not consider yourself an artist, you have um, huge experience in design and what things look like. You arrange your house, um, you choose the clothes that you wear, you cook, you know, that's a creative process. Maybe you garden. All those things are about choosing uh, the way that you, um, you like the look of something or you feel comfortable in a, in a space. And that's all art is. It's about creating visuals that when you look at them, you feel good, you feel comfortable, you feel you respond to it. This is an abstract piece um, I did. It's probably a good example um, to look at this piece um, because the design principles, um, I can point out various design principles here. Um, I have got 
part of a circle. I didn't want a whole circle. It's too powerful, too, it would have grabbed, the eye would have been drawn to the circle, it would have been too much. So I've, I've broken it up. I've got part of it here, part of it here, and it's cut off. So um, it's also red, but it's a muted red. It's not too, too bright. Um, you've got a lot of directional wedges. The eye comes down this red one and hovers here. You've got this wedge, which keeps your eye up here. Lots of, um, lots of wedges that move your eye around the surface of the, the piece. And then there's textural elements um, that draw you in more intimately. So maybe you have a crease in, in the paper. Maybe you have um, something that looks very soft and you come up close to look at it. So a piece is different when you look at it from far away or when you look at it close up, maybe you want to touch it because it has a, a textural element that is compelling. All those things are ways of appreciating artwork and responding emotionally to artwork. Um, and as you're making it, you want to think about those things, how you're making this piece from your knowledge, your experience, your, your feelings and some, you know, you may reach people, you know, they may have a similar response to your work or, or maybe not. It really doesn't matter. It's about um, expressing something that you feel. So um, we've, talked about, we've talked about design principles and we've talked about um, abstract collage and you've had a go at both of those. Um, the next thing we're going to look at is um, is what I call narrative collage. It's really um, referred to as photo montage often, um, but I like to call it narrative collage because it's um, not a traditional, uh, you know, story line like you know when you use words, but you still have um, some kind of visual story happening within the the picture, and it's a really um, it's a really fun, easy, accessible, playful, relaxing process. Um, so that's what we're going to do as our main project. Now you've kind of got your um, toe in the water with cutting paper and um, working with paper and glue. So um, let's start um, by recapping paper a little bit. We talked early on about the kinds of paper that um, are good to collect. I uh, might hang on to things that come through the mailer that you would normally throw away. Uh, old magazines are great. Things that have words are uh, good to um, collect. Um, I tend to um, gather, gather magazines and books that I feel might um, have potential with a nice diverse range of images. And then what I do is I, I, I hang on to them until I'm actually going to do a collage. And then I um, start looking through them. And it's, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's a, rather than having an idea at the beginning, like I'm going to do a collage about, you know, and have a kind of a, a solid idea of the end result. It's not, I, I don't really work like that. I tend to, um, let it happen. It's a bit, it's quite organic. So I'll start flicking through uh, books and magazines. And as I'm looking through them, um, something will catch my eye. I'll, I'll be drawn to an image. Maybe it's humorous. Maybe um, it's just compelling in some way. And uh, when I found an image that I I like, I tear the piece of paper out of the, or cut it out of the magazine or book. Um, and then um, I just keep it like this, like a, a page from a book. And I start accumulating um, pages. And I do that until I have a good array of images that I have responded to in some way. Now, they don't necessarily relate to each other. They may um, not be things that I end up using, but there's something interesting about them. Um, and then when I have a, a great big stack of them, you know, piles of paper often, 
Um, what I'll do to actually start the process is I'll start sorting them because it can be a little overwhelming to have a massive array of images. And I actually had this happen to me um, you know, this week when I was prepping for this class that I wanted to have a, um, a sample of, of, of works to show. And I started cutting things out and I just was completely overwhelmed. Um, didn't know where to start, had a day of, of complete failure basically where I, where I didn't make anything because I just couldn't, couldn't choose what to start with. Um, so I think um, having had that experience, I wanted to stress that it's really important to, um, you know, to start simple and not um, plan to make some kind of great big complicated piece. Um, I would say that it would be a good thing to do to start to, um, to warm up to the process uh, by doing a collage with only two elements. So you cut out two things and you juxtapose them together. And I'll show you some samples in a minute. Um, but a good way to, um, to sort is thematically. So I'll have my pile of paper and I'll go through them and I'll have, okay, animals, uh, people, uh, this is automobiles, and I'll have stacks of different themes so that I can find things a bit more easily. Um, that just makes things a bit more manageable than this, which is a pile of anything from peas to um, a lady in a speaker and some biscuits. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming to have to have this kind of chaotic pile of, of images. So, um, so organize your images first. And then um, what we're gonna start with is some really simple paper, um, just on, on paper uh, collages. Uh, for this, I would use a glue stick. Um, it doesn't buckle the paper like a liquid glue and you can just paste it on and stick it down really easily and quickly. This is, think of this as an exercise, you're playing. It's not, um, not anything uh, t pressured, it's just having fun really with images. So you've, you've got your piles, you've got your things that you've actually cut out and then you start putting them together. So let's look at a couple here. Um, I, I like to have masking tape um, nearby. Masking tape is great because you can stick paper down and then peel it back up and it doesn't rip the paper usually. So it's a good way of placing things and arranging them before you actually glue. You really don't glue until the very last stages of the process of collage. So I have this, let's hope it doesn't rip. Hope this, have this little baby bird that I cut out, very compelling. And then I have a nest. Now, one of the things about collage that is narrative collage, that is, I find so fun, is the juxtaposition of different things that um, may not go together. Or maybe they go together, but not in the way that you are gonna assemble them. For example, this is a very small nest and a very big bird. It wouldn't work in real life. Um, you don't want to be recreating, um, you know, a photograph. You know, you don't want your collage to look just like a photo or reality because um, what's the point? You want to make an image that um, is something that, that couldn't really happen. You know, either it's very funny or it's, um, uh, you know, may, may have a serious, a serious message, but you're basically bringing disparate images together to, to make a new image. So I've got this bird and then I cut out the nest and um, it's awkward. Like, how do I make it go in to the nest? So there's techniques where you can, let's see, I've got a cutting board. This is a useful thing, but if you don't have it, you can just use cardboard. And um, if you do have um, a, a scalpel, you can, um, as well as cutting, I cut out all my images with scissors, but if I'm working to cut something out in the middle of the piece of paper, I use a scalpel. 
So here, what I did was I cut uh, the top here along, along the edge of the nest so that I could tuck the bird into the nest. And that's rather funny, I think. Got this great big baby bird in a tiny little nest. So really simple. You've got, you've got two images juxtaposed together and I find it rather humorous. So um, at this point, I'm gonna stick it down. So I, it's quite good to have a working surface that isn't the paper itself. So I might bring it over here to, to glue it. And again, this is, this is playing. I'm just messing about. I'm not worrying too much about the end result. I'm not going to like show this in a gallery or I might not even show any of my friends. I'm just, I'm just playing with materials and having fun. You could do this on paper. You could have a sketchbook and, and just keep all your collages like this in, in one place in a sketchbook so that you can look back at them. I'm sticking the nest down, but then the bird has to tuck into the, um, the seam that I cut. Then I can arrange it. I don't glue anything down until I've decided where I want everything to be. Because what would happen if, for example, I, I glued the nest down and then let it dry, and then I wanted to put the bird in the nest and I realized that I couldn't because the nest was already completely glued down. So you really want to think in layers and um, not glue anything until you're absolute, you've sort, thought it through and you know exactly where you want everything to be. So there's a really simple collage. It's two images. Um, I find it quite funny. I could cut it out and give it to someone as a card. I, you know, it, it's just a, um, an easy, accessible, fun start to playing with the, the materials. Here's another one I did earlier. Some lemons and a girl balancing on the lemons. The, when, we, um, when I talked about design, we talked about things like contrast, contrasting colors, contrasting scale. Um, here you have lemons that, you know, in comparison to the girl are enormous. And then this girl balancing on top of them. The, this couldn't happen in real life. That's why it's interesting in a, in a um, image because, because it's surreal. It's um, like a magical world. You know, you're, you're making, you're telling a story um, with, with imagery that, that is uh, magical or um, fantastical in some way. So, um, and that's, that's kind of the beauty of it. You're, you're playing with, with kind of a world that doesn't exist. I came across this lady and she's got a, <laughs> she's got a wheelbarrow of, of cucumbers or something. And um, I thought it was a, a hilarious photograph. And then I realized I also had some, some pickles um, cut out. And so the two things, you know, are, are humorous together. I placed her on top. I, I chose a background of a garden. So as if she's, she's just come from gardening, she's been working, she's just harvested all her um, cucumbers at the end of the season. She's really pleased about that. Look at her smile. She's thrilled. And, um, and here, are two, here are two gherkins that, um, you know, I imagine them like they, they've fallen out of the, the wheelbarrow or something. Um, just, you know, just a humorous, humorous image. I'm entertaining myself, basically, when I make these collages. <laughs> Here's um, a, a boy. He's having a great time on, um, I've forgotten what these things are called. You bounce along on a little, oh, pogo stick. And um, he's looking a little bit shocked. And I've just glued him over the top of um, uh, a volcano as if he's kind of hopping away from, from this volcano, he's slightly panicked. Just two separate images together. So sometimes with this, you'll have a background and then a foreground. So you've, I've got one image um, as my background, I'll stick one thing over the top. Whereas the bird was two images on a plain background. Um, 
two images coming together as one. So there's a couple of ways to do this. I cut out this, um, this lady from a, um, a mattress advert from the 50s or something. And um, then I found this, this picture of, of this sweet little bedroom and just placed her on top. She's obviously too big, you know, so that's the, the interest comes when you have things that don't, don't um, work well together. They, they kind of, they're believable, but then there's something peculiar happening. Like, oh, she's way too large for that room and why is she exercising on the bed? Um, here's another one. I had these, um, these two rather, this odd scene. I love things like um, old magazines, um, encyclopedias, um, what's they called, uh, you know, at the end of a, end of college, you get like a yearbook, things like that are really, really bizarre images. You don't know what's going on. You've got this guy here and he's got his hand on the head of another man who's sitting down. Like what is happening in this, in this image? So it's compelling because I'm curious, you know, you look at a piece of artwork longer if you're confused or a little baffled about the subject matter. So I don't know what's going on here, but it's interesting. And then I decided it looks like he's kind of like trying to push his head under water. So I found, um, I found a pond and I cut a little strip with my scalpel through, um, through, the, through the water. So first of all, I tucked him down here and I was experimenting with um, different, different heights. Now, that looks a bit odd if they're both wearing suits and they're standing in a pond. It doesn't really work. Um, but as I lowered it down, it kind of became more interesting as his head got closer to the surface of the water. <laughs> and, um, but then I, I didn't like how, uh, how much in the foreground it was. So I cut another little slit and experimented up here. When I glue this down, you're not really gonna see um, the other one, but I liked it better up here. So they're further away, the water's a bit darker, and I just thought that was kind of funny. So um, I would then, once I've decided exactly where it is, I might put a little bit of tape just to remind myself kind of where it is, or maybe even draw with a pencil, make a little mark where you want it to be so that when you take it apart to glue, um, you can see where it is. And then I would just take this, I would glue over the whole surface, and then I would glue the back of here, and then I'd have my base paper or board, whatever I'm working on. I would glue this down lightly and tuck it in, and then try and press everything down so that it, um, it adhered in the right place. So this is, um, this is playing. This is just having fun with paper, with images. I'm telling, um, I'm telling a story of some sort. Obviously, this is, um, you know, this is a moment in time, and you use your the viewer uses their own imagination to to ask questions and answer questions as to what's going on. You know, you're oh, is he running away from the fire? I, you know, I don't know what's going on. What what's she up to? So you're creating images that that excite curiosity. That's, that's the goal. So the next, um, the next project or the next stage of this um, is going to be working on um, a panel. Uh, the advantage of a piece of wood or any sort of um, uh, thicker structure is that when you're working with a liquid glue like um, you know the Elmer's or Mod Podge or matte medium or wheat paste, it won't buckle um, and distort the, the paper. If you work on um, regular paper, you'll find that um, the glue pulls and you'll end up with a, a, a bent surface, which um, can be hard to, to flatten out. So I, I always like to um, work on something a bit more substantial. If I'm doing something that I want to, I don't know, give, 
give to a friend or sell or um, I want it to last a bit longer and I want it to be more of a kind of a finished piece. So far we've been playing with uh, the materials and doing almost like exercises and, um, and this is um, going to be something that maybe I'm going to keep. So um, I'm going to start with this. I just got some uh, chipboard and um, had them cut it down at the hardware store, sanded the edges, really cheap um, stuff to use, um, but it works really well. So uh, I sanded it uh, so that I didn't have any, you know, sharp edges that could give you splinters. And um, I'm going to show you how to uh, lay a flat uh, background and then how to arrange onto that. So um, you can use anything really. I mean, I like to, to use color just because it has a, a dynamic um, element to the, to the piece. But I also use things like uh, the brown bags from a supermarket. Um, they can cleanly cover the whole area. It's a nice mid-tone. Um, it works really well. It's large and you can pick it up um, really anywhere. It's really easy to get hold of. Um, I'll show you the actual process of gluing because although that seems like it's really straightforward, there are some tricks that make it uh, look, look better, the end result look better. Now, one thing to um, stress is that when I'm sticking down a background or any kind of large piece of paper, I want to make sure that there is not any um, gap in, with the glue. I need every single piece of this covered with glue. I'm going to use wheat paste as, as my demo glue just because I like working with it. So I'm going to start by getting it on the brush. These kind of brushes are um, really cheap. You buy them from uh, craft stores or uh, hardware stores. Um, I like to have this wide um, brush. It's just holds more glue and it's easier to cover a large surface. If you have a really tiny brush, then sometimes by the time you get to the other side of the, the panel, the glue at the top is already dried, which is very annoying. So I'm really going to make sure that every single bit right up to the edges is covered with glue. If you don't get right to the corners, you're going to have flappy paper. It's going to be annoying to you. OK, so I've covered all of that. Then I have my uh, paper that I'm going to stick on. And I'm going to do the same to that. I want to cover. I may not go right to the edges with this because I think it's bigger than my panel. Now, if you're working at home, do cover your table with plastic or newspaper or something. Um, this, this glue is easy to wipe off. It's not really um, going to stick and ruin your table, but it is probably better to protect the surface. So here's my paper. And I'm going to show you how to stick it down without any kind of ripples. So here we are. I often use my hands. Um, you may not want to do that. And if you don't, just use your brush. And I'm going to start in the middle and I'm going to do big sweeping motions to really get that stuck down well. Now, one of the things about some paper, not everything, but a lot of them stretch as you're sticking them down and you'll find you'll start gluing them and then you'll have a, a wrinkle. So if that happens, just sweep the, the brush across the surface to make sure that you really have everything stuck down nice and firmly. Now, I always, when I'm collaging, do put glue on both sides of the paper and the um, board. 
So you, you saw me put the glue down on the board and the back of the paper. And then I put another layer of glue on the top. And that creates a really tight, clean, um, well-adhered surface to work on. Now this is all wet. The great thing about wheat paste is it doesn't dry quickly, so I can work with it quite some time to get it, to get it cleanly stuck down. You can see that there's elements um, and ripples in the surface, and you'll find that when it dries, a lot of that goes away but I do recommend really working this quite thoroughly to make sure it's really, really stuck down. Now, see these flaps on the edges? I always leave that, and I'll show you how I deal with that um, in a moment, but I always leave, it, um, leave them on because then your paper goes right up to the edges and you have a really kind of clean edge. If I tried to cut this first, to the right size and then stick it on, you may find that you don't quite um, get the right size. And I really want to make sure that it, it goes right up to the edges. So it's flapping over the edge and that is just fine. So when I've done this, I'll let it dry for a while. I'll leave it to, to dry before I start the next stage where I'm actually um, working with the images on the background. Now, you may not have a background that is one flat color. You may have a background that is um, a collection of, of, I don't know, you may have like, here's you know, some blue paper. You may stick this down and you may, have, you may have found a landscape and you may glue that down. So you don't have to cover the whole surface. But what I like about this is that if I've covered the whole piece, it doesn't matter if I cover it all up, with, with imagery, but I have then got some kind of cohesive background that is, um, I don't have to worry about filling any gaps in the wood unless I'm choosing to uh, leave the wood exposed. That would be another, another option or choice. So here's a sample of one that I glued down earlier. And I just want to show you how I cut the edges. I'm using um, a little uh, square scalpel, but you could just as easily use something like this. Be very careful because it doesn't have a handle. And what I do is I just run it down the edge like this. And it just peels, cleanly cuts. Let's see. So then this is um, cut flush with the edge. And I always then use these little tiny pieces in, in other collages. <laughs> so I always keep these off cuts. I have boxes and boxes of them. So here's, um, here's a, a base that um, you can then work on. I, I do highly recommend using um, uh, supermarket bags, you know, the brown supermarket bags, because of the, the tone is so lovely. It's like that mid-tone is really nice to work with. You can then put darker colors and lighter colors, and it gives a kind of neutral background that's really, really pleasing to work on. Um, okay, so we have, this, we have this base. I've got another one here. So this one, same, same technique, I glued on the background, I cut the edges, but then I've started to add in some imagery. Now, this is a very personal process. You know, we talked about looking through magazines and books, finding imagery that kind of gets your, you know, grasps your attention, tearing it out, cutting it out, piling it into themes, and then starting to cut out individual imagery. Um, and at this point, when you've got, you know, a selection of images, you, don't, you probably don't have an idea of how the end result is going to look. This, you're still in the creative phase. You're still playing and you're still experimenting. 
Um, but you're starting to think about what might work, you know, what might be interesting to, to have together. Um, it might be amusing. I've got all these kids. They're all eating something. But what I was thinking was that I'd cut out some other smaller things and put put it into their hands so that instead of holding a sandwich or, um, you know, whatever they're eating, they'd be about to eat something else. I don't know, a bug or something. Um, tiny dog might be amusing. Um, so, so basically, I'm just kind of entertaining myself and um, thinking about what might be funny or what might be, um, I don't know, you might want to make a really serious collage that um, is political or, um, or tells the story of someone you know, or maybe you want to do um, something for someone that you care about, You're, you want to, to do a, a birthday card for them or something personal where the content is driven by um, the, you know, the intention. So I do a card for my mum and I think about all the things she likes and I bring them together in an image and that's kind of the driving uh, force behind the work. That's the inspiration behind the work. Or I'm trying to illustrate um, with my abstract collages, I'm trying to illustrate a place or a, a feeling about a place that I want to capture visually. So there's usually an intention behind the work um, of some sort, you know, whether it's to be funny or um, political or, or just tell an interesting, create an interesting surreal image. So here I have these kids I haven't decided, I could, you know, pile things on their heads and create some kind of, um, you know, collage like that. I quite like this to have, you know, the way you have this large expanse of, of plain area and then everything clustered at the bottom. In terms of design, that, that appeals to me. It, it's the contrast of, of space and void and then very um, focused action down the bottom. If the whole thing was full of action, maybe it would be, um, you know, kind of harder to read it. Um, so that's something to think about. Don't, don't hesitate to leave space. It's, it's good to have um, elements of, of quiet in the picture, of, of stillness, in contrast to areas of action. So here's a few examples that we'll, we'll look at. Um, I started with a pink background and then I found this fantastic old advert, um, kind of a booklet for different televisions that you could buy. And there was just a load of TVs, old TVs. So I cut all the TVs out and here they are. And then I cut out a bunch of things because I like the idea that with a television, you can cut out the screen and add anything so that it looks like the TV is showing a, a, a show about, about whatever. So right now, these two are plain. And then these, I cut out the actual screens because this is where you can start to have fun. I thought it might be interesting to have a strawberry, a very large strawberry. So these all are cut out with the screens cut out. And then what I did was I started to cut out imagery that I thought would be humorous or interesting to have as the images that are showing on the TV. So I've got some guinea pigs here look like they're in a cage. But you'll see that I haven't cut it out um, to fit yet. I've just cut it out as a chunk and I've taped it together to see if I like it. I, I might change my mind. Here I have a dog's face. I find it amusing because the dog is so large in the TV. It kind of looks like it's trapped. 
in the television. And then I've got um, a similar image where you've got a close-up of a boy blowing bubble gum. So he, he's in that one. Um, let's see what else I've got in here. Uh, you can use Ziploc bags, you know, to sort things out. Collage is quite um, chaotic sometimes because you, you end up with all these images and it can, can be overwhelming. But you can start sorting things out uh, by putting them in bags. I've got a, a fire here. I've got some large ants, close up of ants. And uh, this was funny because it says TV whiz kid. And um, so I thought that might be interesting to use uh, the words in it somehow. Um, I'm not sure what that is. I don't think I need that. So, so then I'm going to take this and just kind of slot, hold this over the top and start seeing, you know, whether I like it or not. You can move it around. You're usually, so, so we talked earlier about um, the idea of touching base with how you feel. And um, the important um, aspect of that when you're actually working is this kind of uh, looking and then you want to go from looking and experimenting to to being alert to how you're feeling about it. You know, you're, I'm looking at it. I, I usually have, it's almost like um, I feel it in my gut when I know that I found something that I want to use. It's like a very, um, it's almost like a physical response. And I'll be looking and that won't work. And then I'll get another and I'll be playing with that. I often you listen to, um, I either listen to music or podcasts or audiobooks, and it's interesting um, when you're when you're listening to either words or uh, music. It has a different effect on the way you work, um, and you should probably experiment with with both those things and see which one um, you know works best. If I'm listening to um, to words, I find that sometimes it enables me to. Uh, it takes up um, a certain part of my brain so that the visual part of my brain sort of goes into automatic and, and I start doing things without sometimes even attending, being conscious of it, but it's quite a fluid process. So um, I'll be just kind of listening to the radio, um, listening to a podcast, and I'll just be moving the paper about. I'll be, you know, looking at uh, different images, and then I'll just feel in my gut when something's right. So I have this little dog, and I'm, you know, I try it here, and I'm like, yep, okay, that's good. I want that. I want to keep that. And then I keep moving through the other images. So that's um, a kind of a, a hopefully, a insight into the actual um, process and maybe how it how it feels to make decisions about an end result. Um, with this, I was thinking it might be interesting to have some sort of shelf uh, system for the TVs to sit on. Um, I was gonna maybe cut this out. This is a, an image from a, uh, an interior design magazine. And let's see, so I'm just going to cut this. This is um, an image of a wall, but I thought it might work as a shelf. So the, when, when you look at things that you're going to cut out, you may use them in a different context than they're originally um, displayed. Kind of like this. And then you can piece things together. So this isn't long enough, but maybe I could kind of bodge an end with this. Possibly. Not sure about that. But you can um, let's see, place that there. I'm not going to stick these down because this is really just, uh, uh, you know, showing you 
the process of um, the order of operation with, with collage. I've, I've got my background. I've stuck a few things down. Obviously, this one I stuck down before the kids. So the two TVs went down and then the child. But I had moved them around and decided where I wanted them before I, I did anything with glue. You know, you're not going to use the glue until you've really made that decision. So let's, let's, I'm just going to stick this down so that you can see the process. So with this, I've already trimmed the dog so that, um, so that it's the right size. A good way to do that is you might hold it over the, the TV and then just look around the back and then just cut it out so that you, it's not too big or too small. And then, whoop, I'm not sure where I want this TV. That's the only problem. Maybe I want it just balancing on the top of this one. Let's see where it should go. And so I need to place it first. It needs to be down a bit. Maybe about there. So I'm going to leave the dog down and I'm going to tape it just so that I know where I want it to be. And then the same process that I used before with the background. Actually, I'm going to just mark it with a pencil. Then eyeball it and put glue down. Doesn't matter if the glue is over a larger area because when it dries you can't even see it and again make sure you go right up to the edges you do not want any patches that do not have glue on it because um, as soon as you kind of have that that gap you're going to have um, paper that's flicking up or flapping or loose and I, I unless you're intentionally doing that um, you want to try and make sure that it's as flat as possible. Now, this kind of paper is the kind of paper that ripples. You see straight away how you've got a surface there of rippling. I often use my finger to, to flatten things down or a brush and sweep out from the middle more carefully when you're using thin paper because you can rip it if you, as it gets wet, it obviously is even more fragile but see how I'm just sweeping out from the middle quite carefully to make sure that the whole thing is stuck down. Then this has already got glue on it because I've just, you know, done the bait, the background, the background of the dog and on top. So now all I have to do is glue this. Do you see how I'm doing this and the glue is getting all over the background? Doesn't matter because it just almost works like a varnish now i have to place this you'll see how the edge is flapping off the side that's fine because i'll just cut it off like i did the background and i want it to look like this tv is right on top of and sitting on this other tv here slightly believable but slightly surreal and then i'm going to do the same thing quite carefully now because this has very thin um narrow pieces of paper so it's a bit more fragile now if by any chance you did as you were sweeping tear it it's actually not too problematic because all you need to do is then um, stick it down i mean you kind of fix it as you're as you're attaching it it doesn't really matter if you end up with a rip i did that with the um with the woman and the pickles i ripped her head off accidentally and um but i just glued it down with the body and it worked fine. So there we have a little dog on TV balanced on another TV that I think I'm just going to put that strawberry right there. So it doesn't matter if you get gluey fingers with this, it, it just washes straight off. It's like cooking. There. So 
already you're getting what I call a narrative. It's not, um, it's not particularly complex, but you've got two kids that are looking a little bit perplexed and um, they're looking towards you. So they're not looking at the television, um, but they're coming towards you as if that maybe they've just seen something that they find a little bit disturbing. He's just like, oh, what's, what's happening? And um, she's looking for reassurance. So immediately my mind goes to what's happening. Like, you know, have they just seen the televisions and now they're, you know, trying to you know, find their mom or something, or, you know, are they scared of this dog? You know, what's happening? And I don't know what the end result of this is going to be. I haven't finished it. I haven't got a plan for the end result. I'm letting it happen. It's a process of, a creative process that is um, playful and um, relaxed so that you're really letting the images dictate the end result. Um, it's, it's why it's such a relaxing art form, because, because it kind of creates itself if you let it. So that's, um, that's um, as far as I've gone here with the, with the gluing. And then what I would do to complete it is just to, to keep working. It might take me, you know, a day. It might take me a week. I might um, do this and then put it aside and come back to it. Um, it's quite good sometimes to have uh, your work, maybe, I don't know, in your kitchen or when you're doing other things to glance at it. You'll, it's quite interesting how your brain keeps working away at something. You'll look at it and think, oh, I know what I could do. I could add, you know, I've got that picture of a dog um, or a, a cat. I could have a cat sitting on the TV or, you know, oh, maybe a bird's going to fly in from the top. You know, you'll, you'll, um, your brain will just keep working away, kind of, you know, it's a, your brain is a natural storyteller. So it'll just keep working away and, and entertaining itself with the possibilities of the piece. And, um, and it's just a magical process. You'll find it just sort of like, you know, it kind of makes itself. So this one, you know, I, I, I won't keep going on um, with this because it's something that might, might take several hours. But I will show you some other samples of other pieces so that you can just get an idea for different, different options. So we've, um, we've looked at various... Um, various collages and and you know a few different things that I set up before I came here to give you an idea of of possible visual outcomes I'll just run through um, a couple here that I've cut things out but not taped uh, not stuck them down um, this is from wallpaper it's interesting because um, as a cage you know you can you can put something in it so that's kind of like the television screens as well. You can fuse two images together, creating a, some kind of interesting story. So I thought this was, had potential. And then um, I gathered a few images of things that might work in the cage. You could have a collection of dogs. And um, obviously I'm gonna play with the placement, try and get the heads in the gaps so that they're not blocked out by the cage wires. That's a possibility. Uh, I could have a bunch of bananas in the cage. Doesn't really make any sense, but, um, but it's fun. A small child could work. So, the, you know, the, this is the, uh, you know, more examples of, of playing and then placement. So I've collected three images together here and I've moved them around quite a long for quite a long time trying to get it just right I had her um, at first she was kind of brushing the dog's nose it looked like she was picking the dog's nose with her finger that didn't really work um, so then I moved her over behind and it looks like she's just kind of um, you know rubbing the dog's head and he's putting up with it scale is interesting you've got this giant dog and a smaller person so they're they're you know we were talking you know, with the design rules earlier on. This is contrast. 
Um, the dog has been enlarged, the woman has been shrunk down, so you have an interesting um, dialogue there. I also have a colour, a dog, you know, it's, um, it's a colour photograph and a black and white image of a woman, so you have a contrast there visually. Um, the child, without the child, it just seemed, um, well, I had two problems. I had this circle here that was part of a, the advert, and I wanted to cover that up. So I needed something to come in here and um, get rid of this, this problem here. Plus, it just, the, what, the dog's nose kind of came down and your, your eye just sort of went off the side and it, it wasn't quite contained enough. So um, this is where the design principles come into play that I'm just um, subconsciously thinking about how to create an image that keeps your attention focused on the surface. So I take this child and I, because um, the hand is sticking out and because the child looks sort of excited, it works. You can tuck her or him behind. The hand can be right on the surface as if the, um, the child is uh, touching the, the dog and I also, angled it a little as if she's kind of running towards the dog whereas this has a different feel like the child is maybe a little bit afraid of the dog or hesitant so depending on where you place it it creates a different narrative and that's part of the the artistic choice if I had it down here the foot would be chopped off so I'm gonna wiggle it around until I feel good about the placement and then I just use the tape to to stick it down and then when I've done that, that's when I glue. Sometimes, I think I've already mentioned this, but sometimes I'll mark it so that I can take the pieces off, glue them, the background, glue the back of the image, and then I know, I know where these pieces are. Just mark key points, you know, the tip of the, the shoe or whatever. So that's... Um, that's how I am considering the design as I'm working. These ones are glued down, and I just wanted to do a couple where there was an end result. So this I stuck on the background. I didn't want to do one color, I wanted two, and I wanted the color to be vibrant and um, pop, really strong design. Um, this is uh, not exactly divided in half and it's not exactly a third either but you have um, quite a clear um, difference between the upper section and the lower section the pink and the red then on top of that I had this child with a bowl of noodles but it wasn't particularly interesting as is so I wanted to add something that was peculiar into it. And I found these little owls that were peeping out of something. And so what I did was I cut, just like with the nest earlier on, I cut along this bowl, and then I slotted the owls down into the gap and moved them around until they were just in the right place. And because the color is quite similar here, you really don't notice them at first. It just looks like the kid is about to eat a meal, but then you suddenly see these two little eyes and these owls popping out and it, it becomes humorous. Um, at first, this, the bottom of the owls were showing and I thought I should cover them up or I might need the bottom of the bowl to show, but then I decided that in terms of design, you have a balance here between the abstract, so you have the flat background, and then you have this odd little thing that doesn't make sense, but it actually kind of works almost like a little um, shelf or seat or, or base to this image. Uh, so I left it exposed. And then this corner was rather annoying to me. So I added the mouse um, to, to cut uh, this corner so it wasn't um, showing so much. And I felt it needed color. So without the yellow components, you can see what it looks like. And I just wanted something